Pharisees went and conferred on how to trap Jesus with a riddle. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, to say, Teacher, we know that you are honest and that you teach God's word forthrightly and that you're impartial because you paid no attention to appearances. So tell us what you think. Is it permissible to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? Jesus knew how devious they were, and he said, Why do you provoke me, you phonies? Show me the money used to pay that poll tax. And they handed him a denarius. And he says to them, Whose image is this? Whose name is on this coin? They say to him, Caesar's. Then he says to them, Pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. When they heard his reply, they were dumbfounded, and they withdrew from him, and they went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Even with all the mockery and castigations against him by the therapist, 
Brother Boyce shows that he has tried to complete various tasks required by the therapist to make Brother Boyd normal. All Brother Boyd wants is to be returned to his community, to his family, and most of all, to his loving mother. Throughout the session, we find that Brother Boyd has been subjected to all sorts of requests to assist him in his recovery, which he attempts to do and fails, but he attempts to do it because he wants to be normal. Any questions why? Why am I not supposed to wear a wig? Why do I need to dress differently than how I do? Why do I need to act differently than how I do? Why is my mother not visiting me? When the therapist realizes that she does not have control of the session, she quickly ends it, informs him that his mother is dead, and that he needs to come back tomorrow and to start participating in your own recovery. Shocked by the information that his mother was dead, begins to leave the session and say, Yes, doctor, I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll participate. But before he closes the door, he says, No. No, 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 no. No. No, I will not participate in my own recovery. Not if it means not being who God made me. Often when I for a sermon, I will read many different versions of the scriptures. This week I read four different ones before I found a version that challenged me. You see, I was so accustomed to seeing the word tax and tribute that I glossed over the words without giving them a second thought. But then I saw this poll tax version. Now being from the South, the term poll tax intrigues me, condemns me, makes me uncomfortable. For we Southerners have a relationship with the term that is part and parcel of our collective past. Now, is there anyone here who would like to explain what, to a Southerner, the term poll tax means? Anyone? <coughs> Having to pay for the right to vote. Having to pay for the right to vote. And why did we have that poll tax? Some people can vote, and other people don't. But as I researched the term, however, I found that poll tax does not necessarily historically mean this. Poll comes from an antiquated English word that sometimes meant head. In the traditional <coughs> sense, a poll tax is a fixed amount per person in accordance with, uh, with a census, and it's not a percentage of someone's income. Now, the poll tax spoken about in today's gospel lesson was the Roman tributum capitis. And if I'm mispronouncing my Latin, please forgive me, Mama. She had five years of Latin, I had two. <laughs> anyway, so it's the Roman tri tributum capitis, a tax of one denarius placed on each person who is subject to Rome, but not a Roman citizen. This was a tax of occupation. This is what the Roman writer Tertullius called the badge of slavery. It was this tax that was the basis for the revolution that led to the destruction of the temple. This was Rome's way of having their captive provinces participate in their own recovery. <laughs> now, imagine being occupied by a foreign power, having your way of life disrupted and supplanted by a foreign way, and then be required to pay a good day's wage. And for many people, it was the equivalent of two or three days' wage. And if you think our unemployment is high, back then, jobs were scarce too. But you're paying this because you are not a citizen, because you do not have rights. We often believe that the tax collectors were despised by the Judeans because they cheated. They took more than what, what was a fair tax because they were scoundrels. We often miss the basic fact that these tax collectors were collaborators. People who decided to side with Rome rather than with their neighbors so that they would be in a better position. See, these people were willing to participate in their own recovery. Then comes these Pharisees to ask Jesus if it were lawful to pay the tax. Was it lawful to be subject to anyone other than God? These other Pharisees went away dumbfounded from what Jesus said, not because he was sly and coy and avoided the question, as we have often been taught, but rather because Jesus directly told them in no uncertain terms that it was not lawful to do so. And in doing so, he called them out as collaborators.
liars and worse as blasphemers. Now, Matthew's recording of the story, it doesn't really flesh that out as much, but Mark's does, because in Mark's version, you can tell that this is happening in the temple. So Jesus was in the temple teaching, and these other Pharisees came and asked if it were lawful to collaborate, collaborate with the occupying forces by paying the tax. When Jesus asked to see the coin and the other Pharisees presented it, a coin with the head of Caesar on it, a graven image in the temple where graven images were not allowed, a coin dedicated to Caesar who is named a god, specifically God, son of God, and savior of the world, inside the temple dedicated to the one true God who had no name and whom no human could bear to see. The other Pharisees attempted to trick Jesus into sedition, yet in the end, Jesus revealed to all that these Pharisees were blasphemers because they had sold out and were already carrying an idol into the temple of the one true God by having that coin. Now to all the Jews who listened to Jesus, pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God, it was a clear call to reject Caesar and all Caesar stood for and to give, God, give their lives to God who created everything, ruled over all that had been created, and was alone worthy of praise. For everything, everything belongs to God, which means nothing, nothing belongs to Caesar. How often are we willing to sell out just like these other Pharisees? How often are we willing to participate in our own recovery by buying into the ideals of society, of working hard so that we can have nice things, while others do not even have a roof over their head, of speaking proper English so that others will know we're educated, when others are denied education merely because of their citizenship status, of sending our children to the best schools, never asking why schools exist that are not the best. How often are we willing to give charity to the poor without being incensed and enraged that there are poor? How often do we look at the brother boys of this world and quietly think to ourselves, well, he had it coming for him. And how does God respond to us? How does God respond to our collaboration and our own oppression to the empire of humanity? How does God deal with us who have sold it? tell you how. By inviting us to say no. God invites us to say no to participating in and conforming to the world's ideals, and yes to participating in the reign of God and conforming to the image and likeness of the Christ unto whom we have been grafted through our baptism. And through us and our being imitators of the Lord, as Paul reminded us in our second reading, we are called to invite others into participation into the distributive justice of God's holy reign. And why does God do this? Why does God gloss over our sin? Because God has created us as family, and God wants us all to be free to serve one another and care for one another as family members serve and care for one another. Furthermore, God's invitation to participate in the divine commonwealth, God's holy reign, is not limited to us Christians, or even to those who know God. For as we heard in the scripture from Isaiah, God gives to Cyrus, a king who does not know God, treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, and does so in order that all may know God's great glory. For the God who created us to know, to, who created us, knows all of us, each and every one of us. As for power and riches, keeping up with the Joneses, none would exist without God. Without God, there are no riches to own. Without God, there's no power to have. Without God, there are no Joneses to keep up with. Without God, there is nothing. So to God alone be the glory, not to Caesar and his coins, not to society and its norms, but God alone. The reformers had a phrase for this, soli deo gloria. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your heart.
hearts and minds in